You may be an ambassador to England or France, but that's not going to save you from old Muhammad's rants. And when his followers come around and the cries of Allahu Akbar sound, remember, they don't really have the moral high ground. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here. This week in Jihad is back. I am sorry to say, it, in a perfect world, there would be no This Week in Jihad. And we would be discussing happier matters. But we are here with the great Dr. David Wood. David? Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Yo, how's it going, everyone? Uh, yeah, the uh, <laughs> people noticing we're a couple minutes late. Can't blame AP right now. No, this is me. Uh, computer is, for some reason, not recognizing my camera, so couldn't get that uh, fixed. So anyway, if there are any uh, audio or visual problems here, it is because I just uh, plugged into a laptop here. So uh, hopefully, hopefully everything still works out. You look very bright and sharp. And I believe, is that Socrates behind you? Um, or play? Yeah, but... Yeah, yeah, Socrates? Very good to see him. Yeah, yeah, we get Socrates. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. All right, so, Jihad. Of course, most of it is about Israel, and so we can get right to it. This is... Let me get her picture here. Um... Where the heck is she? Oh, here she is. This is Angela Merkel, the former Chancellor of Germany. And she is talking this Reem Sawahi. Sawahi? Uh, just a second here. Let me get her, let me get her name right. Reem Sawhill. Saw, Sawhill. Anyway, she uh, was a teenage girl in 2015. As you can see in the photo... She was at a, uh, a, 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 a some sort of an open session with the Chancellor of Germany, uh, a discussion between Merkel and a group of asylum seekers. And uh, she said that not all the asylum seekers would get asylum. Merkel said this, whereupon Reem Sahu... Sahu <laughs> yes, it's already a good evening, ladies Reem. and gentlemen. Just yeah. say Reem. Reem, this little girl here, she started to cry. <laughs> Whereupon Angela Merkel comforted her in a unique German fashion and, uh, of course, was granted asylum with her family. And so it was a very happy story until this past week when the same little girl... The same teenager has gone on record saying she wants to see Israel destroyed. She wants to see 7 million Jews killed. And so this is what Germany has brought upon itself without realizing. Yeah, and uh, I, I don't know why German Germany would have a problem with that. I mean, that was, uh, you remember old, you remember old uh, Adolf? I remember him well. Old Adolf? Yep. Uh, if we just... If we, if we, if we could just have the religion of Muslims, we'd conquer the world. And yeah, then, uh, and so now they got it. And then, uh, yeah, they're getting what they they're getting what they wanted. Yeah, and so I'm sure there's some people, <coughs> excuse me, in Germany who are very pleased with how things are working out. Uh, and of course, uh, there's no doubt that even though young Reem has now gone on record in this way, nothing's going to happen. Nobody's going to say, "Hey, maybe we should reconsider giving this family asylum." Uh, nothing, nothing will change. This is, here's a, no, here it's, go again. what's, what's, what's interesting is you could take whatever she said, you could take her exact words. You could take her exact words Yes. and replace is Israel or Jews or something like that. You could replace them with some Muslim country or Muslims and it would be international uproar. It would That's be an right. international uproar that someone said this sort of thing. But if it's a Muslim saying it about Jews, totally fine. You're correct, sir. All right, I keep trying to bring this guy up. Let me try it again. This is uh, Sardar Abulfazl Shekarchi. And he is the uh, deputy for culture <laughs> in Iran. And also the defense, oh, culture and defense propaganda of the general staff of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran. He's got a very nice Zabiba, you can see there. Yeah, that... Another, mm -hmm. another, another banging Zabiba. Yeah, we're, we're on a Zabiba run. 
in this uh, this series of this week in jihad. Anyway, uh, Sardar Abul Fazl Shakarchi, he said that the October seventh massacre is the greatest success of the Islamic world. Now, surely he was misspeaking. Am I right, David? I mean, how could he say that a massacre could have anything to do with a great success for Islam, the religion of peace? Well, hey, I'm wondering, does he mean like all time? Because that should show like what the priorities are. Yeah, he did not qualify it. And so I think we could reasonably say (laughs) that it was for all time. So wait, so... (laughs) <laughs> we've we've got the uh, we've got the second largest religion in history. We've uh, had 14 centuries uh, of conquering. We've got 49 countries where we're the majority, and the greatest thing we've ever contributed to humanity was killing a bunch of uh, men, women, and babies. Uh, yes, uh, in Israel, the greatest wow. success of the Islamic world. Sardar Abul Fazl Shekarchi. Well, you know what's funny is you could sit back and go, "Oh, come on!" But 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 there have been so many successes in the Muslim world. <laughs> oh, wait a minute! Like, wait, well, hmm, let me try to think of one. They invented uh, chess. Oh, okay. That's they it used remi- to go around. You know what's funny? They invented chess. They didn't even invent chess. It, re- it reminds me of of Socrates when he uh, supposedly got word uh, that the Oracle at Delphi had declared that no man is wiser than him. And he's thinking, what what are you talking about? I don't know anything. So he says, so I go around looking around for anyone uh, who knows something. So that would prove that I'm not the wisest man. And I just went around and found out, oh, no, no, actually, no one, no one knows anything. But go. that's how it is right now. It's like, it's like, this is the greatest thing we've ever done. It's like, oh, no, come on. I'll go look around for some, uh, yeah, darn. Well, you remember a few years not, not back, not work, not work with. I think they're still around. There used to be all these things. Uh, there was an exhibit in the British Museum, 1001 Islamic Inventions, mm. and they invented coffee. That was they the invented dumbest this thing ever. Yes. Uh, it was the dumbest thing ever for one thing because, like, for example, they had some guy that they dragged out that nobody ever heard of saying that the uh, earth went around the sun long before Copernicus said this. And I thought when I read that, well, how come nobody ever did anything with it? If the, if the Muslims invented all this stuff, then they just let it go and did nothing. And it, mm-hmm. t- it, it went to the West. It was up to the West to do something with these things. So it just actually <clears throat> made matters worse. Yeah. No, and a bunch of it. I looked. I looked some of those up. I made a. I made a video responding to some of them. But I was going to go down the line. But they would actually, um, they would actually threaten to sue you over uh, responding to their stuff. It was so weird oh, um, man. that they're contacting YouTube and having any criticisms of their uh, stuff because you have to put the, the the clips of what they're saying up, and then they would. Uh, they're blasting with copyright strikes. So anyway, I, I won, but I, I kind of lost interest just because it was, uh, just because I, I didn't feel like doing it over and over and over again but no those were abs they were abs you could go down the line it was absolutely ridiculous every single every single thing like uh, the, uh one of the students pulls out a pulls out a camera phone and then the muslim jumps out and goes oh i knew it was a great idea when i thought of that and he's explaining <laughs> how he came up with the uh, how he came up with the camera and so on and it was so it was i mean aristotle talked about the, the what's called the pinhole camera the camera obscura this guy just had one and he said, hey, it's like it's like an eye. Now, keep in mind, that is a good insight that the reflection of an image mm-hmm. uh, inside a camera obscura is is similar to how things work in an eye. And that's what that's that's the thing. That's an important insight. That's important. But that's all the dude did. He didn't invent a camera. He certainly didn't invent a camera phone. Uh, he had a camera obscura, which had been around a thousand, you know, for a, for a thousand for over a thousand years. And he just compared it to an eye. But there's always this 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 degree of uh, they have to exaggerate. I could say mm-hmm. like like uh, Al Jaber, he made contributions, impo- very, very important contributions to algebra. They'll say, no, he invented algebra. He didn't invent algebra. There was algebra. The Indians had algebra. The, the Babylonians had algebra. The Egyptians had algebra. The Greeks had algebra. They all had they all had some form of algebra. Um, and yes, this guy played a role in its development. He didn't invent it. They always have to, whatever the, whatever reality is, they have to, they have to, they have to dial it up like a thousand fold to make, uh, Islam sound interesting. Yeah. It's just, uh, and, and, that, you, and you wonder why can't you just state things accurately? 
And, you, and the answer is because it's not enough to be impressive. Yes, they, they have to exaggerate because they're manifesting a certain insecurity at the fact that they really have very little to show for being around for 1400 years. Uh, I'm, hey, I got a question here for you, David. Oh, it just jumped. Here we go. Why is David looking up to Janna? And I was wondering that myself. You, you, you keep on looking up as if maybe Gabriel is speaking to you. Is, is he there? Can, um, can we get him on screen? I'm, I'm used to looking up at my camera when I'm live, but now my camera's down here because I just opened my laptop because uh, this camera won't uh, isn't working right now. With, okay. So. Anyway, get used to it. It's just it's just a natural. I'm talking to look up like this now. It's just a technical thing. OK, so we'll just go with it now. A little bit of background. This is not uh, strictly speaking something from this week, although it started circulating around again this week. And I thought it was a fascinating and important story. This is Arafat wow. Irafaya. Arafat Irafaya. Yeah, I know. He's got the eyes, man. Um and Arafat Irafaya, he murdered Ori Ansbacher, who was a 19-year-old girl in Israel, back in 2019. And uh, his uh, testimony, at his, uh, what do you call it, when he was interrogated, his, what he said during his interrogation, so it's not strictly speaking testimony, but in any case, he's, he's explaining what he did. And this was going around this week, and I thought it was chilling, but it was very important. He said, and this is kind of in line with, uh, what was that What was that guy's name? Sardar Abulfazl Shekarchi. Anyway, Arafat Irafaya said, um, oh dear, now you know you, you know something, David? I click off, click off it, and it just disappears. The djinn are at my computer tonight. It's a day of technical difficulties. You yeah. see? You see, the curse. <laughs> Here we go. Hello. Here we go. All right. Arafat Irafaya said, The murder is the best and most important thing I've done in my life. If she had stayed alive, it would have meant that I failed in what I planned and failed in my mission. It was the best feeling I've felt in my life. Now, remember, he's talking about a brutal murder here, a terrible rape and murder. And he says, I planned to enter Jerusalem and murder Jews. I wanted to kill several Jews and not one. But when I was there, I saw that Allah had sent me the Jewish woman, and I understood that I had to kill her. This was the fate to which Allah had summoned me. Now, surely th this guy's hijacking Islam, right? Uh, yeah, got to. But I mean, think how that ties into the, I mean, he said, this is the greatest thing ever. This is the greatest thing ever mm -hmm. getting to kill. You, and then the other guy, uh, hey, the greatest thing, the greatest contribution of Islam to the world has been killing Jews. Yep. Now, why would the greatest thing, why would both of these guys, an Iranian official and this loser in Israel, think that killing Jews was the greatest thing that Muslims could do? Could you elucidate well, that for us? Well, think about, I mean, you could go in multiple directions with this, but just think if, if according to the Quran, Surah 5, verse 82, Jews are the worst enemies of Muslims, then in slaughtering Jews, you're taking out the worst enemies of Muslims. And then, you know, if you're actually helping, if Muhammad, since Muhammad said uh, that uh, the end will not come until the Jews are hiding behind trees and rocks and the trees and rocks are saying, hey, here's a Jew, come kill him. Then, you know, you're helping bring about the end times. And uh, this is this is how all you guys are going to get your virgin. So. So it kind of sounds like Allah is a demon from hell, David. Yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty rough. It's pretty, it's pretty rough. And by the way, going back to going back to talking about uh, various contributions and this sort of inferiority complex. That has developed in the in the Islamic world. I mean, think about that. I mean, how many Jews are there in the world? Like fifteen <clears throat> million, something like that, globally. Yeah. And if you act, if 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 you asked, hey, uh, what contributions have they made to the world? You just start, you know, counting up uh, Nobel prizes and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting that you've got, I mean, you've got fifteen million Ju fifteen million Jews total in the world. You've got around two billion Muslims, um, and 
it, it's just it's just this like inferiority complex that has developed. They're supposed to be the worst of creatures. We're the best of peoples. Look at what they actually contr contribute to the world. Look what we do to the world. And uh, let's just go kill them. Something's wrong. Hey, I don't know if you see it. Douglas Murray actually broke it down, and he's saying, <laughs> okay, he's breaking the psychology down. And he says, okay, if if we got the book, we've got the final revelation. We've got the final prophet. We're all these things. Things should be going really, really well for us, and they should be going really terribly for everyone else. Instead, it's the reverse. And so what, what are you going to do here? You can't say the problem's with us. We're the best. Um, and so the Jews must have just rigged the game. They must have rigged mm -hmm. the game out. And so at all costs, you have, to, you have to take them out. Exactly. That's it. And so that's what we're seeing. Uh, and... Of course, I think probably the biggest story of the week, although it's not clear what happened exactly yet, comes out of Los Angeles, where there was a 69-year-old man, Paul Kessler, and he was demonstrating in favor of Israel. And the uh, details are a bit murky, but it does seem as if he was hit with a megaphone on the head by this gentleman, Loe Al-Naji, Al -Naji, who uh, is a professor at Moore Park College in uh, Camarillo, California. And he it's not clear yet that he's going to be charged with anything. He has not been arrested. The, uh, killing, the, uh, the death of Kessler was ruled a homicide, but then the police said, this doesn't mean it was a murder. I'm not quite sure what the distinction is there. But apparently, uh, I guess the idea is that he, that Al Naji may have hit Kessler, but not intended to kill him. And then he fell backward and hit his head and ended up dying. Uh, but there's no well, doubt that these things are getting more violent. These demonstrations are getting more violent in general. Yeah, that, that would normally have something to do with intent. So if it's, uh, I'm looking right now, being investigated as. Uh, homicide have not ruled out the possibility of hate crime but yeah if it's supposing it's accidental like he just wants to hit him but then the guy you know falls and dies that would that would be man that's what manslaughter is for <clears throat> manslaughter not intending to murder someone you might be intending to hit them or beat them up or something else but you're not intending to murder them but they die anyway and that, that should be manslaughter the other big story I have actually not been able to get to today uh, in detail because it was down for a long time. It got so much attention that Honest Reporting, the site that reported it, uh, it immediately was overwhelmed either with an attack or with people wanting to see it and the story was unavailable. So uh, I, haven't <clears throat> I haven't been able to see it in detail yet, but uh, you know, David, the story is that AP and uh, Reuters and I believe CNN, other reporters, were uh, notified of the attacks beforehand and were on hand to take pictures as the massacres of October 7th were going on. But of course, the AP and Reuters photographers did not notify Israeli officials or anybody else they didn't want to lose their scoop and they didn't care how many people died in the meantime. So I think that's not a really so much a stupid infidel story as an evil infidel story. And, yeah, that uh, would be evil <clears throat> infidels category. Oh, yeah. But uh, why do you think they would do that? What on earth are they thinking? Um, I mean, if you're th there are situations where journalists don't want to. <clears throat> their sources and so on and i guess they could use that as a justification but my goodness if you i mean it's it's similar to it's similar to doctor patient confi confidentiality if you're talking to a psychiatrist or something like that that, that things are privileged if if a person's saying hey we're gonna go if you're talking to a, a patient and he says oh, i'm gonna go murder a bunch of people that that kind of okay peels off. Mm -hmm. peels off now i gotta tell yeah one would think but in this case it uh, just went off without a hitch and nobody seems to have minded. It seems to me that with the incredible bias against Israel that most of these, actually all of these uh, outlets have, that they didn't really even care if a lot of Israelis were killed. 
<clears throat> I hope that this will lead to a thoroughgoing house cleaning in these uh, agencies, but unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. These alleged news agencies, that is. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing about this for the first time right now, so I'm, I'm hoping that something comes out to explain this and uh, and show that it's not as bad as it sounds. But uh, yeah, I mean, think about it. So worse, if, you're, if, if it is as bad as it sounds, then the reasoning would kind of be that it's just now ingrained into these news news agencies. Well, what? What, what are we going to do? Notify, notify the Israeli authorities, and then they stop Hamas? What? <laughs> then, then we'd be siding. We'd be siding with the <clears throat> oppressors, and 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 getting getting freedom fighters killed. Yeah, yeah, that's probably it. That's how the left thinks, certainly. And uh, meanwhile, other stupid or useless infidels. We go to Britain, where there's never any shortage of such people. Very interesting uh, situation where there was a group of counter-protesters at a pro-Hamas rally. And, of course, the pro-Hamas demonstrators all had their Palestine flags. And the uh, counter-protesters brought British flags. Who do you think the cops told to put their flags away? Uh, the ones they regarded as either bad or somehow worse or as <clears throat> less likely to <laughs> to beat the crap out of them. Yeah, uh, obviously the British police are afraid of the Muslim demonstrators. They told the British people to put away their flags and one of the cops said a very revealing thing as he was asked, well, why are you telling us to put away our flags and not telling them to put away their Palestine flags? And he said, there's way more of them than there are of us. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly going to keep on being true in Britain and only become more, more true as time goes by, given the demographic trends. Yeah, and uh, think about the message that the British police are sending. British police are sending a message to not uh, not just not just to people who are who are waving the British flag. They're sending a message to Muslims. If you want your way, just be more just seem more dangerous and more threatening than anyone else, and we'll give you whatever you want. Uh, yeah. You want us to silence other people? Just tell us who you want us to silence, and we'll go uh, we'll go silence that uh, that person. So this, of course, is the heckler's veto, where the hecklers get to decide what people are allowed to say notice we've seen this we've seen this over and over again so we're seeing it here with the recent protest uh hatun tosh would be in the middle of a bunch of people threatening to murder her and police would come in and arrest her they don't arrest mm -hmm. the people who are threatening her they come and arrest her for being the cause of this problem by upsetting these people to where they uh, are threatening to kill her um there was that woman who was silently praying near an abortion clinic near an abortion clinic so you don't even know what this woman's doing like hey what are you doing she's like i'm praying uh oh you're praying i'm praying silently i'm not i'm not saying anything any word and they arrested her um and it's just like gosh man so <laughs> so be be a be a jihadi screaming murderous bloodshed and threats and you get a free pass uh, other than that don't even pray my yeah, you know, and then I wonder about all the Muslims uh, taking a whole street and filling the street and praying, and yeah, nobody ever bothers them, you know. And they do that in uh, hey, in they're... Hyde Park by Speaker's Corner as well. Yeah, now that that would be a sight. So <clears> the <throat> British made it some sort of where you can't pray against abortion near an abortion clinic, and so on. you can't do that. Right. I'd like to see Muslims show up and, and line up the line up their prayer warriors near an abortion clinic as a as an experiment yeah, and see what the British police can. do. Yeah, suddenly. Oh, OK. Well, if it's them, they can, of course. Yes. So we know who's in charge in Britain and we know who will be in charge in the yep. future. All right. Uh, more uh, uh, stupid infidels. This is the. uh <laughs> This is Darren Borders, the diversity and inclusion officer at Cornell University. And uh, he has been in the news for writing on Instagram pro-Hamas 
and pro jihad Instagram stories and uh, saying that the Israelis were all in the wrong and so on. And uh, Cornell University, when they found out that Darren Borders had done this, they said, well, he's been on a leave of absence. But they didn't say anything about uh, firing him. He'll, he'll probably be back. Notice on his lapel, he's got Black Lives Matter and uh, one version of the gay flag. And so he's tied in with the entire uh, left's list of virtuous things. And that's why he hates Israel and loves the Palestinians. Probably has no idea about jihad and thinks that any concern about jihad would be Islamophobia. And it is, uh, it is interesting. It's been pointed out, like, um, you know, all you... Uh, all the people you, who are celebrating the, you know, the attacks on October 7th and so on, all the people screaming, you know, free Palestine and so on. You got Muslims looking around saying, oh, look at all these people who are supporting us. Guys, think about who's supporting. Think about the, the people who are supporting you. You got the whole LGBTQ and far left community and they've got your backs. You've got all the Marxists, all the Marxist organizations, and they've got your back. None of you actually get along with anything. Uh, you, you wouldn't get along. None of these groups would actually get along with each other. Um, but I mean, think about this. It's think about the kinds of groups. It's all the groups that want to destroy Western society unite. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, as we talked about last week, uh, you've got these que queers for Palestine. And meanwhile, in Palestine, you've got the Muslim cleric saying, we don't want your support. We don't we, we don't uh, want you around. Mm -hmm. And they would be thrown off buildings or dragged uh, at, behind motorcycles or whatever if they were there all right and wasn't it wasn't it just like two wasn't it just like two or three months ago where oh we can't believe that they don't support us and they're uh they're not supporting pride month and we feel betrayed <laughs> betrayed that they won't support pride month and oh they won't even allow uh pride flags up in that city that's now controlled by muslims here in the u.s wow what's going on here oh wait we're it's some jews involved yeah we're all on the same page again friends forever well it's uh, certainly true that the left a lot left islamic alliance seems very strong right now when it comes to hating jews uh but it is breaking down over the lgbtq business uh, Hamtramck, Michigan, the city you're referring to, has an all-Muslim city council. They barred uh, the gay flag on city property. All these leftists started to say, you are betraying us. We have supported you all these years. And this is what we get. This is the thanks we get. Anyway. Yeah, you know what you know be, you know to be a good inroads right now, a good uh, some good bridge building? Yeah. The uh, local LGBT. The local LGBTQ there should take that uh, the modified Palestinian pride flag, you know what I mean, where they combined the yep. pride flag with the Palestinian flag, and then go say, "Can we have this on public property?" <laughs> and if they say no, oh, we can't, we can't support Palestine. Oh my goodness, look what Muslims are doing. Zionists. That's what I would do. They are Zionists. <laughs> Zionists in the, city won't let us, the Zionist city council <laughs> won't let us <laughs> support Palestine. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's getting good now. All right. This is Pierce Corbin. <laughs> Pierce Corbin is the brother of Jeremy Corbin, who used to be the leader of the Labour Party in the UK. And uh, Pierce Corbin, his brother, was recorded uh, the other day, and uh, people said, what, what do you think about this uh, massacre on October 7th? And he says, well, I don't know. You see, Hamas and Israel, Israel funds Hamas. You understand that? Israel let these so-called troops in. They allowed the hostages to be taken. The whole thing is a game to justify the flattening and genocide of Gaza. You see Israel and Gaza. Israel funds Hamas. You understand that? Well, he said that already. Uh, there is oil under Gaza. The Israelis want it. The Americans want it. And they, somebody says to him, how did you feel when you saw the butchering and massacre of those kids at the rave? And he says, it was a lie. There was no killing of children. It was a lie, a lie, a lie. 
the Israeli government admits it was a lie. They were actors. That's what Piers Corbin, the brother of the former leader of the Labour Party, and no doubt a Marxist himself, said in Britain. What do you think, David? Is it? It's interesting how uh, everyone blasts Alex, jo Alex Jones for years as a complete lunatic for, you know, after a school shooting, he would say, ah, it's all, it's all staged. It's all staged. Where are the pictures? But notice, even if you, even if you showed the pictures of the, you know, some people don't want to show pictures of their massacred children. Uh, but suppose you did. Suppose you showed pictures of all the massacred children. Would that have solved the issue? No. Of course, these, these would, uh, these would have all been staged because the parents, of course, were all actors. Now, he eventually changed his position and so on. But everyone thought that was really absolutely insane, saying that uh, this massacre is all staged to uh, justify taking the government taking your guns. And so they're, they're staging all these school shootings and so on. Uh, and, and having just I mean, think about how many actors need because that's an actual school. So if you actually are claiming that a bunch of kids at that school were massacred and it's not that is, i mean that is a ton a ton of people who should know that this is all a setup like if no kids are actually missing uh it seems like you would know anyway uh but but notice so everyone everyone says what a lunatic what an insane person but then as soon as it's israel oh yeah 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 uh, that's all that's all staged and the hamas guys these are paid actors and so on and and that, that is just entirely reasonable. And so, yeah, they're, they're, uh, Hamas is just funded by Israel. And, of course, the Palestinians voted for them because uh, the Jews convinced the Palestinians of Gaza to vote them into power and so on. It's just like, once, I mean, once you go this road, you could just say anything. You could just say anything mm -hmm. you want. Yep. Because reality has gone out the window. Speaking of reality going out the window, David... Actually, there's another big story from this week, aside from the other ones, uh, and that comes out of the Biden administration, which has unveiled a new initiative uh, in the wake of this massacre in Israel of 1,400 people, which is massive in, connect, in relation to the population of Israel, makes, makes it proportionately a much larger attack for Israel than 9-11 was for the United States. In the wake of that, the Biden administration this week unveiled a national strategy to counter Islamophobia. Anti-Semitism... Well, that's good. As long as, as, long as, they, got their, as, long as they got their priorities right. Yeah. Anti-Semitism is skyrocketing. There's violent anti-Semitism in the United States. Uh, the, it's, it's become a, a, a daily occurrence. There's several stories of people ripping down the posters of the Israeli children who've been held, who are being held hostage. Uh, the uh, man was killed in Los Angeles. A kid got his nose broken at Tulane University. The uh, Kaibar Kaibar genocidal chant is sounding all over the country at, at, at demonstrations, and the administration is starting to fight Islamophobia. And not only that, David, but the administration's new initiative to counter Islamophobia will be led by the Domestic Policy Council and the National Security Council. National Security Council. So you know what that means, David. You and I were terrorists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We are threats um, to national hey, that, security. That whole, that whole story reminded me of a of a tweet from the late Norm Macdonald. This is from mm -hmm. 2016. ISIS were, were slaughtering everyone. And Norm Macdonald tweeted. So for anyone who doesn't know, he's a comedian. Uh, but he said in a tweet, what terrifies me is if ISIS were to detonate a nuclear device and kill 50 million Americans. Imagine the backlash against peaceful Muslims. <laughs> imagine, imagine ISIS launches a nuclear device and kills 50 million Americans. What about the Muslims? <laughs> I wrote actually uh, great minds, you know, great minds think alike, David. I wrote a few mm -hmm. days ago an article at PJ Media called the Biden regime is setting policy by old Norm Macdonald tweets and uh, quoted just that one. That is indeed what there's what what's going on here, that uh, 
there was a massive Islamic Jihad attack, and in response, we get the uh, initiative against Islamophobia. I don't, I don't get that at all. But in any case, I think that it's important to note that Islamophobia is sort of a trick. It refers to two different things. It refers to vigilante attacks against innocent Muslims, which nobody is in favor of and are never justified. And if that's all they're talking about, then fine. However, the same word is also used to refer to any kind of analysis of the motives and goals of jihadis, which would mean that David and I are Islamophobes, as of course we are often called. And thus the National Security Council is going to be looking at us. I hope that they will not be banging on our door at four o'clock in the morning, but you never know these days. All right. Uh, meanwhile, we have more stupid infidels in Britain. This is actually not a stupid infidel. This is a guy taking advantage of the situation. This is Mohammed Kazbar of the uh, Muslim Council of Britain. Rock the Kazbar! <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Anyway, uh, <laughs> he is the chairman of the Finsbury Park Mosque in London. And he recently praised the founder of Hamas as the master of the martyrs of the resistance. Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, he said, the master of the martyrs of the resistance. And Kazbar, even though the British government said that it was going to have nothing to do, zero engagement with the Muslim Council of Britain because of their glorification of terrorism, like this guy's praise of Sheikh Yassin, the founder of Hamas, they are actually going to him. He is one of their advisors on hate crime, Mohammed Kazbar. And so they want to know about how to deal with hate crime in Britain. This is the guy they're going to, the pro-Hamas leader of the Muslim Council of Britain. Well, this would be similar to, uh, you know, back in the day, government organizations, if they wanted to know about uh, jihad and so on would go to someone like you then they found out no they have to go to care <laughs> yeah care had millions of dollars and i didn't so uh i wonder if that had anything to do with it anyway uh european union meanwhile speaking of millions of dollars has given 717 million dollars to the palestinians since 2021 and that includes 236 million to gaza well, someone's got to pay for the Lamborghinis for the sons of the ISIS, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, Hamas guys. Yeah, that's an interesting point, that we have these ISIS millionaires, Khalid Mashal, Ismail Haniya, uh, and others. They are actually, not ISIS, Hamas billionaires. Mm -hmm. And you got to wonder, you know, they don't have any income. They don't make mo any money. They don't have jobs. All they are is agitators. But what they do is skim off the aid money that is supposed to go to the supposedly suffering Palestinians. And so the money ends up going to jihad and to line the pockets of these corrupt rulers. And, and it's funny because uh, these guys get to say, hey, you know, jihad is what gives you uh, an eternity in paradise. But some of us need to live in paradise now so you guys know what, you, uh, what you're fighting for. And so we're going to live uh, just like we're going to be living <laughs> And uh, you guys just keep doing all the fighting for us, and we'll just take all the money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Got to get this guy's picture here. Yes. This is... Oh, hold on. Oh, he must be here. Yes. It's just that it's too large, David. We You're good. Leave it up there. Leave it up there. You're good. The whole thing? No. Yeah, why not? Because then we, if we're talking, we can hear you, you know, there you we go. Can, people can hear our voices, and I can imitate this guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is Sheikh Al Booty. <laughs> Sheikh Al Booty, Sheikh Taufik Ramadan Al Booty. I gotta tell AP there's an actual <laughs> Sheikh Al Booty. Yes, this, there he is, man. And uh, Sheikh Al Boudi actually is the son of uh, Muhammad Ramadan Al Boudi, who wrote a book uh, years ago, way back in like 2000, 2001. It's a 
uh, uh, a book I discuss in, I think, my first book or second. And anyway, uh, yes, yeah, Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Ramadan al Budi, and this is Taufik Muhammad Saeed Ramadan al Budi. Uh, both of them Sheikh al Budi. And in a Friday sermon at the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, this guy said that uh, the time has come for the flood to drown Zionist existence by means of the, this unparalleled jihad that has astonished the entire world. And then even though he's talking about an unparalleled jihad, he said, if you look behind, who is behind the great wars in this world, you'll find the Zionists. They are the vehicles of corruption in this world. And so on and so on. And then he goes on to say, in Jerusalem, the great battle will begin in which the rocks and the trees will say, O oh, Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. Indeed, the rocks and the trees will say to the Muslims, O oh, Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. Even the soil, even the rocks will spit out this filthy race of people. Sheikh al Budi. Shake, shake, shake. <laughs> shake, shake, shake. Shake al Budi. Hey. Yes. I know, I'm noticing a parallel with them all praising this as like the uh, the greatest thing ever, and it's like yes. you're, looking, you're looking at it going, all you, I mean, yeah, you 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 killed a bunch of you killed a bunch of uh, Jews and some non-Jews, but I mean, all you really did was tick them off to come in there and 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 blow you guys to bits. Um, but it, to me, it's I mean. It's along the same lines as them having to exaggerate the significance of everything uh, in order to kind of compensate. Like, oh, so some guy said something about a camera obscura being like a human eye. We invented the camera. We invented the camera. All you with cameras. That's us. We did that. We did that. Uh, and so you have all this. There were there were other ones that there were examples that were total nonsense. And they're like them inventing flight before the Wright brothers and all yep, this stuff. Yep. Total, total nonsense. Um, like like e even that one it was even it was a poem it was a poem about a guy who supposedly strapped on some wings and jumped off a tower and crashed uh but <laughs> it was actually it was actually a it was actually based on a on a story of a christian doing that um and so they they basically copied the story of a christian doing that instead of muslim did it and then they they say they invented flight before the wright brothers and they invented the plane and and so it's that sort of situation, but you've got people this mind with this mindset, like we're not actually contributing anything and we're supposedly the best of peoples with the best knowledge and the best book and the final prophet and all this stuff. Uh, you, you got to exaggerate and now. OK, you really you you really walked up and, and punched a hornet's nest right there. And now you're getting stung mm -hmm. and uh, you see what we've done for the world It's the greatest day ever. My goodness, this is pathetic. Uh Another note before we go to some uh, stories that don't have to do with uh, Hamas and Israel. This, once again, is Soheb Abu Ayash, who we've talked about before. Uh, he is in Houston, and he, uh, when we talked about him last week or a couple weeks ago, it was because he was arrested. He had been found with weapons and seemed was in touch with jihad groups. But now it has also come to light that he was plotting a jihad massacre at a Jewish gathering. So he was hoping, old Soheb Abu Ayash, to bring the October 7th massacre to the United States, in apparently in the Houston area. Uh, that's likely to happen one, one day because, after all, it's... With the U.S. government worried about Islamophobia, it's unlikely that anybody much is paying attention to trying to stop these things from happening. All right, uh, let's see. David, over in France, we had a statue of Beatrice of Savoy. Let me find it. This is Beatrice of Savoy. It's a it's an after and before picture. Uh, I should have probably gone into the trouble to reverse them because it's kind of weird. But you can see on the right Beatrice of Savoy, and then how the statue looks now. The statue has been beheaded. Beatrice of Savoy was a 13th century benefactress, a princess of the House of Savoy, 
who apparently uh, bestowed her largesse. Yes, yeah, she made numerous donations to residents, which got her the nickname, the Benefactress of Echel in Savoy. And so they built a statue in her honor, and it has now been beheaded. Can you imagine, can you possibly conceive of any group that might be interested in beheading statues? Well, I can think of uh, one group who has contributed quite a bit of uh, beheadings to the world. So, I mean, you know, if you don't, if you don't know, it, it could in theory be anyone, but it's just like when a mosque gets blown up in Pakistan, we kind of know, we kind of know who did it. Yeah. Uh, we don't know indeed the specifics of this case. And it could be anybody, but you got to wonder, you know, there have been statues in Europe for a thousand years. There have been crucifixes in Europe for probably that whole time as well. And only in the last few years, after a massive influx of Muslim migrants, do you get people defacing, breaking the crucifixes, beheading statues, things like that. You got to wonder if there's a connection. Uh, meanwhile... In France, there was a man in chasse sur rhone or however you say that, in Lyon. And he was walking around with a hatchet and a knife in the busy part of town. And carrying around a hatchet and a knife, he said that he was going to slit the throats of passersby. Why would he say slit the throats, David? Uh, I mean, could just be random or could totally be connected to the Quran saying strike at the next. Well, I have to, uh, yeah, I have to also fill in a little bit more detail. He said that he was going to kill people who have no respect for Islam. Hmm. That'll get them to respect Islam. Yeah. Or Actually, at least get them to get them to pretend. Yeah, that's the problem is that they will take the uh, silent acquiescence and fear as respect and so that'll be good enough as far as they're concerned uh the jihadis that is and so uh it's a shame this guy is walking around with a hatchet and a knife saying he's gonna murder people who have no respect for islam and that's uh he'll he'll get a spurious kind of respect but i mean notice notice how how easy this is to deal with Guy says, oh, I'm going to kill you unless you respect the Quran. You say, OK, well, uh, 50 of us are going to going to pull out Qurans and take a leak on them right now. What are you going to do about it? Um, and then, oh, I'm going to do something. OK, well, then 100 of us are going to do it. That would end real quick. It would end real quick. Instead, hey. instead, we always just reward the jihadis with whatever they want. Oh, you, this is what you want. OK, well, we don't want to cause any problems. So we'll do whatever you say, which encourages them that violence is the way to get what they want here. There you go, David. Um whoops we're getting a threat right here on the show that one's for you looks like remember what we did to Hatoon two years ago that is your inevitable fate if you continue to dare to play around with the fate of two, faith of two billion Muslims guy is spamming the comments with this he keeps repeating it so I guess I'll have yeah, to ban should, him yeah now. just block just block him but uh, I mean think about think about one think about how dumb this is what are you talking about what happened to Hatun two years ago I mean one she got slapped and the other one she got stabbed but I mean then she stood up and started preaching so what you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna stab me and then I'm gonna I'm gonna preach yeah they're gonna lose again yeah, what a, what a bunch of dopes. Like, that's your goal? That's your goal? We, we were just talking about guys doing who do something that has no significance beyond taking a lot of people off and exposing their religion, and they treat it as some great thing. And this guy's been going around for, he's been going around for weeks doing this, Robert. We blocked him from the other from the other channel. So he just goes, oh, 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 what we did to Hatun. And like what? Show everyone what a bunch of clowns you are. Oh, we'll we'll go get this little five foot four woman. Or oh, that's how that's what strong jihadis we are. What oh my dope. goodness! All right, uh, another one out of France. Uh, hospital, a hospital in France got three you, uh, earthquake over there. Hmm? Is there an earthquake over there? You suddenly shifted. No, oh, I just wanted. 
No, I just wanted to point out that uh, these threats make me cry. <laughs> threatening poor Hutch threatening to do to me what he's gonna do to us too we better control we better control our behavior robert because we yes. don't want these guys coming up and <laughs> 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 oh gosh oh man david you are you are you are the heavyweight champion of the world anyway uh this guy and another guy in france i got a lot of france stories this week uh, he, he, these, these, these guys are roommates. One's a Muslim, one's a non-Muslim. The, they get up one morning and the Muslim says to the non-Muslim, Allahu Akbar, we must eliminate the disbelievers like you. Which is not really something you want to hear from your roomie. But, uh, that's what happens but, in these situations. But what are you going to do? If you got a problem with it, you're an Islamophobe, so. That's it. Meanwhile, you got a uh, you got a hospital in France got three false bomb threats this week, and uh, one of them was accompanied by the threatener saying it's going to blow. Allahu Akbar. Now, why would uh, Muslims want to actually leave false bomb threats? What would that be about? Well, that I mean, that's terror too. I mean, that's I mean, that's the easiest form of terror, right? You don't mm -hmm. actually have to build a bomb you don't have to do anything and then it's also a lighter prison sentence if you actually get caught it's hey you know a a bomb threat is uh going to get you in trouble but not as much as actually bombing someone so it's a it's a it's a cheap easy form of jihad but it's the same goal but notice i mean like whenever someone launches a big attack then people around the world decide okay it's go time it's go time when it comes to uh terror and it was similar to uh like when ISIS announced that they had uh, relaunched the caliphate, then you get people from Great Britain and France and Germany, all around the world, US, Canada, all around the world, then flood to Iraq to join ISIS. And it's like, wait a minute, these guys already believed that. They were already there. They're waiting for the call. They're waiting for the call to join the jihad. So they're there, they're, wa they're walking down the street right, right beside you. They're mm -hmm. just waiting for, they're waiting for the time. And, uh, and so you have actual calls to jihad like that. Um, but you also just have, it's just like whenever there's a wave, everyone wants to ride the wave. It's weird. Yeah, there's been a real uh, surge of jihad activity all over in the wake of October 7th. It seems as if, well, I think human beings in general are imitative. And yeah, they, they take this as some kind of a sign that this is time for jihad. Uh, in, also in France... Uh, this kid goes to juvenile court, Dauda Sangare, and he's 15 years old. He's in juvie, and he stands up in court, and he screams, Allahu Akbar, you are all going to die together, which is perhaps not the best way to behave when you're in juvenile court. On the other hand, it's France, so maybe they'll make him prime minister. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, meanwhile, we have an Austria... We have an Afghan Muslim migrant in an asylum center in Vienna. And his hand grenade stash was discovered this week. You got to wonder why a guy in a Vienna asylum center, a poor refugee from Afghanistan, would be packing hand grenades. Come on, Robert, who doesn't have hand grenades lying around? <laughs> well, I have a few over here in the <laughs> office, but... Not really very many, and and they're getting old now. Uh, meanwhile, in Germany also, we have uh, a story from a few months ago out of Duisburg, a Syrian who uh, is my, has migrated to Germany, and he went into a gym, into John Reed Fitness in Duisburg, and he uh, murdered one person, he wounded four others, and now uh, he's on trial. He explained that he what he wanted to do was kill enemies of Islam. Meanwhile, no idea, no idea where he got an idea like that. Yeah, where did he get an idea like that? Don't know. It's weird because it keeps happening all around the world, completely different context, completely different areas. People keep getting the same idea from somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. It's a mystery. Uh, meanwhile, also in Germany, we have 
there was an interview with uh, some young Muslims. You can see them there in the picture. And they say that what they plan to do is become a majority in Germany, abolish the Constitution, and establish Sharia. Which, of course, is completely reasonable. That's what we've been warning that they wanted to do for years. But everybody seems surprised by this and shocked, shocked that they would say such a thing. Uh, wait, wait, ju just to clarify. Yes. Are, you saying, are you saying that they believe it's okay to move to an area that is populated by a completely different group and just keep moving there and moving there and moving there and, and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying until you take over the area? And they they believe that's okay. Yep. Huh. Interesting, because that's you know it's not it's not exactly what happened in uh, Israel, but it's what it's exactly what they their criticism is. Yeah. It's exactly what they're claiming happened, and yet that's exactly what they do. They're doing all over Europe right now. Yeah, it's a terrible thing when it happens when it's done against them by somebody else because the land that they have ever owned belongs to them forever. Hey, isn't that funny, by the way? Here's this tactic that we've used 487,000 times to take, over, to take over cities and so on, take over entire lands. Uh, here's one time where we're saying that someone did the same thing to us, and ah, it's the worst thing in the world, and, and uh, any, any sort of slaughter of these people is entirely, entirely justified, according to our, our theory here. It is extraordinarily ironic, really, because it is exactly the, the same scenario that they've painted in regard to Israel. and uh, But of course, it just shows that they don't actually believe that they're on the same level as the rest of humanity, that actually they are the only humans and the non-believers are like animals, as the Quran says. It's chapter 8, verse 55, folks. And so uh, if the non-believers are like animals, the animals can't behave the way the humans do. The humans can do various things that the animals cannot. All right, uh, you know, we one thing that we don't have so much this week is stories from Africa, which is kind of unusual. But the, of course, lion's share of attention is coming from, I mean, is on Israel and Hamas and Gaza. And then there's all the uh, jihad in Europe, some in the United States. But it is still going on, unfortunately, in Africa as well. And a country that we have not heard much from over the last few years has been in the news. Uh, actually, not in the news, but it was going around on Twitter. Walid Fares, the uh, well-known counter-terror analyst, he reported that uh, in Sudan, in Darfur, West Darfur, uh, 773 African civilians, including mostly teenagers, also women and children, were massacred by the Janjaweed which is a jihad group in that area. Uh, this took me back, David, because uh, I remember hearing about the Janjaweed massacring people in Darfur way back around the time of 9-11. And uh, people would say, but they're Muslims over there. It's all Muslims. Why would Arab Muslims want to massacre black African non-Arab Muslims? Well, they're kind of lower on the, uh, on the hierarchy there. Indeed, Islam is a vehicle for Arab supremacism, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> Arabs often are, uh, uh, at very least, rude and unkind, superior to non-Arab Muslims. Many people have, have uh, observed over the years that Pakistan, which is so fervent in its observance of Islam, is trying to overcompensate for not being Arab and uh, trying to show that they're just as good Muslims as the Arabs. But the uh, non-Arabs in North Africa are often victimized, brutalized, not just subjected to uh, discrimination and harassment, but also to outright violence. Now, I'm, sure you've seen, I'm sure you've seen the uh, stories here, because I've seen them over the years, where even black Muslims on college campuses We'll, we'll talk about how they're treated differently in groups like the MSA, the Muslim Students Association, mm -hmm. uh, how they get treated differently there. Um, but yeah, I mean, even when Muhammad, according to Tabari, even when Muhammad 
notice we have this people have this idea that Muhammad's peaceful in Mecca and then he's violent uh, becomes more violent in Medina uh, but you have even when Muhammad was in Mecca in the history of Atabari uh, and couldn't fight and he's publicly proclaiming hey you no know, to you be your religion and to me be my religion God will judge let's not fight uh, when he was appealing to his tribe to join him he says I will give you a saying by which the Arabs will submit to you and you will we will rule over the non-Arabs. And they're like, what? Give it, give it to us. What is it? And it's it's uh say there's no God but but Allah. And they didn't want to they didn't want to do that. But notice, even there, when Muhammad is in his peaceful stage, he's still plotting to take over the world. It's still part yeah. of a it's all a plot. It's all a it's all it's all a show. All this peace and tolerance stuff, even when he was even back then, was all a show while he's plotting to conquer the world. But notice it's, hey, the, the Arabs are gonna join us and we're gonna, we're gonna rule over. We're gonna rule over the non-Arabs. Mm -hmm. We'll go out there if we could just get behind them. It's uh, all about dominance and subjugation and has been from the beginning. And I mean, think about this. Here we are years later and uh, the real message of Islam is uh, that the creator of the universe wants everyone to walk and talk and act and even go to the bathroom like a seventh century Arab. That's what he's yeah. obsessed with. He just, everyone's gotta be, everyone's gotta live and breathe and walk and talk and think like an like a seventh century Arab. And that's the that's the, the central goal of the creator of the universe. That's it. Well, folks, we hope you will resist that call of the spurious and false creator of the universe. And in the meantime, thank you for being here. There's likely to be more Jihad next week. Oh, next week I'm on the road, David, but we'll see if we can work with the connection. Works perfectly because I'll be on the road next week too. Oh, very good. Okay, so we'll be back uh, sometime very soon uh, with uh, more Jihad. In the meantime, pray, hope, and don't worry.